Hey everyone, this is X O'Connor and you're listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This week we've got Wisdom Moon on the show. Wisdom is the director of We Are Worship, which is the worship resource arm of Integrity Music. He's also known for having created two very remarkable podcasts, one called All About Worship, the other one called Kingdom Songs, both incredible resources for anyone in the worship and songwriting space. And he's also a bit of a marketing guru. He's marketed songs and albums for artists such as Lauren Daigle, All Sons and Daughters, and Greg Sykes. So we got a big one in store for you guys today. He answers some incredible questions. Not going to want to miss a beat of this one. If you guys are in iTunes, make sure to leave us a rating, leave us a review. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe, leave us a comment. We love hearing from all of you. We love knowing what you guys think of the show. Always looking to create the best content we can for you. And again, end of this month, huge announcement and very special episode coming. So make sure you're staying tuned. You're not going to want to miss it. We got something really special in store for all of you. And, uh, you know, if you want to keep up with all things Full Circle Music, follow us on Instagram at officialfcmusic. But that's enough out of me. Let's get us into this episode with Wisdom Moon. We're in the red with Wisdom Moon here in the studio. Hello. Welcome, Wisdom sir. is from Integrity Music, head of marketing, and the founder of All About Worship. Yeah. You want to talk about what's all about worship? It's something that's like all about worship. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually uh, something I started 11 years ago as a podcast. And it's when podcasting had just started and not many people knew about it. And I was a full-time youth pastor and worship leader at the time. And I'm a techie, so I love new technology and things like that. So I started it as a podcast, just really as a hobby for worship leaders. And just felt like, you know, it might be fun to just talk about worship on a podcast this like new platform that was out there and i created a myspace page for it and started i love it connecting with worship leaders around the globe and it quickly grew and two years ago passed it on to a really good friend of mine uh, michael farron so now he's continuing that but it turned in from a podcast it turned into a website and started doing conferences and things like that for worship leaders. But basically it was to, you know, equip worship leaders and just build a community. That's awesome. So you said you started out and MySpace was the platform yeah. with which <laughs> yeah. you started. So did your MySpace grow really quickly with your podcast or what was it like in the beginning? Because podcasts, like, I mean, I remember hearing about them, Yeah, but it was kind of a hidden space on like iTunes. And yeah. I was like, wait a minute, what is that? It's got a purple <laughs> icon. So you said yeah. it grew pretty quick, but how quickly was quick? Yeah, I think within three months, we were one of the top 100 Christian podcasts, which would never happen if you launched one today, yeah, yeah. unless you're a huge you know, name or speaker. But you know, because there were very few Christian podcasts, especially, it quickly grew. And you know, a lot of worship leaders tend to be techies too. So yeah. you know, they all got iPods and started yeah. downloading podcasts. So that was you know, helpful. So I think a lot of it had to do with timing, you know. I think it's fascinating because we got to chat a few weeks back and just hear a bit of your story. But I love that you saw a need and just built something mm. for it. A lot of people, you know, who are in our audience are, are artists or songwriters or producers who really have this goal. They've got this idea of what they want their life to look like, but then they don't know the steps to take to get from yeah. point A to point B, point B being the the yeah. end goal. You ended up building all about worship to a pretty massive scale as a blog mm-hmm. and as a podcast. At one point, like how many readers were you getting on that? I think our email list when I passed it on was about twenty six thousand people on the list, and the podcast got around ten thousand downloads a month, which is incredible. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic, amazing. So. Yeah, and. I didn't have any marketing money or anything. Yeah, yeah. So it was just all, all real marketing and yeah. you know, just building a community around it. So. Man, we talk about marketing a little bit on this show, but probably not enough because it's the music business. It's not mm-hmm. just music. Yeah, You've got to figure out how to market yourself. So what were some of the steps you took to get from zero to 27,000? Because that's obviously yeah. a, a pretty big journey. Yeah. I guess maybe five years ago or so, I had couple of marketing friends in Christian music who would tell me like, man, you need to really build an email list. Because at that time, I hadn't really, you know, 
invested a whole lot into that because once you hit a certain number, depending on the service, you have to start paying a monthly fee. I'm like, why am I going to do that? And after you know, a couple of guys were encouraging me to do it, I was like, okay, let me try it. So I decided to put together a compilation, a uh, digital compilation of worship songs from various independent songwriters as well as publishers and labels. So working with people like Integrity Music, because w- I've only been at Integrity for two and a half years. So I've had a you know, great relationship with them. So they would send me songs, Centricity would send me songs, you know, different labels would send me songs and independent artists. And I curated basically congregational worship songs, put it together in a compilation, threw it up on Noise Trade. And the first compilation, I believe we had like 7,000 downloads. Mm, wow. And then the second one, we had almost 10,000 downloads. So that's how it quickly grew. No listener left behind because that's like gold what you just yeah. threw out right there. Yeah. A lot of people are probably not even aware what Noise Trade is. Yeah, Noise Trade is really a great platform for artists because it allows you to give away free songs or you could give away your whole album to people and all people have to do is give you their email address. And I heard Derek Webb, who started Noise Trade, uh, I interviewed him before, and he said, I would rather have somebody give me their email address than buy you know, a CD at the bookstore for 15 bucks, but I don't even know who they are and I can't reach them afterwards. So that you know, whole mentality of like, you know, building and nurturing that relationship with somebody, mm-hmm. I think it's so valuable. That's a paradigm shift that a lot of people listening, I know, still need to make that switch from. Mm-hmm. It's not about the sale, it's about the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It's not about the sale, it's about the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And so you built a massive community around that. I mean, how, how long did that take to get from zero to 27,000? Probably like three, four years. And I guess you were probably working another job during then? or was that Oh yeah, I worked uh, <laughs> a lot of random full-time jobs. My day jobs were kind of all over the place. And, you know, I'm pretty new to the Christian music thing. But yeah, when I was growing all about worship and building it, I would work 70 hours a week having a day job and working at nights and weekends on all about worship and building that. So, so well, did it ever become a job? Like, did it yeah. ever start making a living for you? Yeah. So before I moved to Nashville three years ago, I was working part-time at a church as a worship leader and doing all about worship for the rest of my week and doing some consulting for marketing with different companies. Yeah. So it, it was, I would say, almost full-time by that time. Did you have a background in marketing coming into this whole thing or (laughs) is it just something you kind of picked up? Because you're talking about a lot of stuff that even we're still learning about. And, you know, we've got this lovely gentleman here, Logan, that's helping enlighten us a little bit. So how did you go about, you know, putting these strategies together and and starting to develop all this? Yeah, I mean, when I launched All About Worship, I didn't know anything about marketing. I didn't know anything about running a business or anything. But when I threw up like a really ugly website using like this service called moonfruit.com, <laughs> a company contacted me, Planning Center, yeah. and they said, hey, can we advertise on your website? And I was like, sure. But I had no clue how much to charge, how to even invoice people or how to add a banner on the website. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just spending hours and hours researching all this and you know, reading books and listening to podcasts about marketing. And I just dove into it. My, you know, major in college was not marketing. It was communication. Okay. And so the only marketing class I took in college was advertising, but it was more about like physical advertising, like yeah. billboards and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Like Magazines. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So everything I know about marketing was just, you know, being a sponge and learning, you know, and trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So was there a moment where everything seemed to click for you when you were like learning about all this advertising? Because you, I mean, to grow that list that fast, I mean, three to four years for 27,000 people on your list and following you. Was there a moment where you're like, okay, this is working. I'm going to embrace this and just keep keep on steamrolling. I would say, you know, I don't know if you guys listen to like Gary V. Um, I do. Yeah. I listen I'm sure to his, a lot of marketers listen podcast. to him. Um, yeah. His, you know, mantra is like add value, you know. Yeah. And I learned that years ago. I thought his mantra had an F word in it. 
<laughs> we're, just, we're paraphrasing here for the safety of all of our listeners. Wisdom will pass the wisdom on to us using filters. You are you are right though. Um, He's got a great book on that called Jab Jab. Yeah, I always mess up the title. Right hook. Jab Jab Right Hook. Yeah. yeah. So before I even knew about Gary, like that's something I discovered just from trial and error and doing the noise trade thing is when you you know add value to somebody, they're gonna become loyal to you and they're gonna subscribe to what you're doing and be interested in, you know, like getting to know what, who you are and yeah. following everything you do. So I think that's the approach that I've always taken is, you know, figuring out the win-win and how to serve people through, you know, like even doing my own podcast, I would always try to interview people that people, you know, our listeners were like interested in hearing from and trying to ask questions that they would want to hear answers so I would involve them and say, hey, I'm interviewing so-and-so, shoot me your questions, you know, on social media and just, you know, that engagement and involvement, yeah. you know. That's a great idea because a lot of people, ourselves included, we're kind of working backwards and reverse engineering the whole thing. But you should really not start with the product. You got to start with your relationship mm-hmm. with your audience. And yeah. for musicians, that's the same thing. You've got to yeah. start with the relationship with your audience. So what are some of the things that people can be doing to connect with their audience? Like, what are the right questions to even ask? Yeah, I would say one thing right now that's huge is live video. So, you know, just getting on Facebook Live or Instagram Live like you were doing just a few minutes ago, (laughs) you know, (laughs) things like that, where I think more and more people are wanting that real time engagement, you know, with the artist or songwriter and so giving people that opportunity and just having them be a part of what you're doing in the moment you know and also I think there's a big mistake that a lot of independent artists make where they don't do a lot of social media and you know they don't share a lot of content until there's an album coming out then it's just self-promotion and all about the album but I think it's so important to before you release anything to start, you know, adding value, you know, giving people content that encourages them or something that's just funny, you know, that connects people, them to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The emotional connection, the humor is such a powerful thing for people. So, you know, just giving people encouragement and, you know, just speaking into people's lives and adding humor to their life, you know? Yep. So we're talking about start with add value, ask later. Mm-hmm. And we're actually testing your theory. I'm back on Instagram live right now. <laughs> All right. So if anybody's got questions, that feels, feels kind of feels like a radio show. I know. <laughs> Wisdom Moon is a black belt in marketing and built <laughs> built a blog from zero to 27,000 people. Mm-hmm. So if anybody has marketing questions, ask them now. And I'll Google it and yeah. give you an answer. <laughs> yeah. but we've got a guy off camera actually yeah. doing that right now. He's our, he's our fact checker. Yeah. I have a little thing in my ear. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, man, I'm just fascinated because all of this stuff is like, a lot of people don't think it applies to them, but it, mm. it totally does. Whether yeah. you're in ministry, whether you're yeah. in, as a songwriter or a producer, what are some things that you kind of, man, going back over your career, I'm sure there was a lot of mistakes, man. Mm. Do you care to elaborate on any of those and and share some of the things that you've learned with, that you wish you would have known yeah. starting out? Yeah, I mean, I think I try to forget about my specific mistakes, <laughs> but I try to remember the lessons I've learned, you know, with All About Worship because I didn't start it as a business. It was, you know, me volunteering my time to build this thing. And I eventually started recruiting others, you know, other worship leaders who wanted to be a part of it. And, you know, at the time that I passed it on, I had about 12 like contributors or volunteers that were helping me with, you know, writing blog content or reviewing albums and things like that. And I think one of the things that I could have done better is even I had even like part-time people at some, you know, parts helping manage, you know, the website and things like that. And I think what I could have done better is not having such high expectations because I am an (laughs) achiever and a lot of times overachiever. I expect a lot from people as well. And for having volunteers or, you know, part-time help, I think my expectations were pretty high. So there were some relationships that got a little weird because of that, you know, and, you know, I've been able to kind of, 
bring reconciliation, you know, since then. Yeah. But I think that's a lesson that I learned. For so myself. how do you balance that with, because honestly, to stand out nowadays, it has to be great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like good is not good enough. It can't be pretty good. It has to be great. Yeah. To get totally. hurt. So how do you balance that? Yeah. I think there's two things, you know, it's, do you put more value in speed or quality? Mm -hmm. So I think for me, my value was in the speed over quality. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was expecting quality, but with the speed that wasn't really realistic, you know, maybe the speed that you would do things, right? but maybe it wasn't realistic to other people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think that's the balance that, I mean, it all comes with communication. You know, you have to like make sure that's clearly communicated and make sure like your deadlines are communicated and things that I'm expecting in my head maybe weren't communicated out loud. So yeah, yeah, that finding the right balance, what works with speed and quality. It reminds me when I first moved up here and started working in music, the person that owned the studio that I worked at said in every business, especially in music or in anything related to music, there is a triangle. And mm-hmm. at each point of the triangle, there's one point's good, one point is fast, one point yeah. is cheap. And you're only ever going to get two of the points. Yeah. It can be good and fast, but it's not going to be cheap. It can be fast and cheap, but it's not going to be good. Mm-hmm. It can be, you know, it can yeah. be cheap and good, but it, it's not going to be fast. Yeah. So. All my stuff had to be cheap. So that yeah. was like a given. <laughs> that so, was a given. Yeah. And, and another, we do talk a lot about teamwork and you know collaborating and stuff at what point did you feel like okay i need to start bringing on extra people to kind of help me push this and grow this yeah i think it's when i realized this is bigger than myself you know like all about worship isn't about me and like what i can bring but it's about what this community can bring to the global you know worship leader community so as i was like trying to you know, increase the level of content and the frequency of content for podcasts and blogs and having labels sending me albums, you know, before they were released so we can review them. But I'm like, I can't review all these albums and write all these blog posts and do a podcast and have a full-time job, you know? So at that point, when I had a bigger vision that went beyond myself, I realized like I need to bring on people who believe in this, you know? And by the way, we are on Instagram live. So if you've got questions, if you're in music and you've got questions on marketing, we're literally here with the Oprah of (laughs) Christian music marketing. The male Oprah. The male (laughs) Oprah. (laughs) The black belt. This is the reverse day, right? Reverse day. (laughs) Do we have any questions? Well, we, we do have a few questions here. <laughs> Go for it. How do you market songs in a video saturated social sphere? How do you market songs in a video saturated And that's uh, Jesse Dean Rivero. <laughs> <laughs> so I do oversee the marketing of songs at Integrity Music. And I have Morgan, who's also here, who helps me. T Rex. T Rex. <laughs> That's her I had to look name. to confirm. I was like, wait a minute. I'm not. I so, have to, I, have to I mean, we focus, uh, like, we are the, the people that do song marketing at Integrity Music. And our focus the past couple of years have been creating content around songs. So it's not enough nowadays to just release an mp3 on itunes or spotify you have to create content around the song whether that's a lyric video or a tutorial video yep. or a song story video now something that we've been doing lately this is a little secret that i'm going to share <laughs> is devotionals around songs and doing like short video devotionals by the artists so it could be like one or two minute you know video devotional around that song you know so like greg sykes reverse and all the other songs on his ep he did a devotional and those you know we would upload directly to facebook because facebook you know they don't want you to share youtube videos they want you to directly upload it to facebook because they want to out do youtube so you know i think that's important to directly upload videos to facebook and also sharing stuff through Instagram stories, you know, just quick little nuggets about a song and there's a scriptural reference, you know, talking about that. And also another great opportunity that's out there is version. So if you are a writer, if you can find somebody that can write devotionals, you know, having written devotionals that you send to version, they love getting those. So Very cool. And version being, you know, because most people probably just know it as like the Bible app. Yeah. 
Yeah. But you're saying for their content site. There's yeah, hundreds of devotionals there. And you can search by topic and oh, wow. yeah, so and that's free promotion, you know, for your that's, songs. That's gold. We got any more questions? We got a few questions. We've got Madeline McDo. Hey Madeline. Are press kits important when you're reaching out to companies? I would say I guess I wonder what the definition of, of companies are because nowadays there's so many bloggers out there. I mean, there's still the you know media size like new release today and things like that. But I think there's a missed opportunity with bloggers who have a niche in something. So we reach out and have a relationship with worship bloggers. And there's some big ones out there that you know we work with and we, we do send media kits and press releases and things like that. But I don't think... The traditional, like you have to have a publicist that writes a press release. You know, if you don't have the budget for it, like I wouldn't worry about it. You know, I think if you can send something that's compelling and that's unique to what your story is and what, you know, your music is, you can package it in a way that, you know, piques their interest where, you know, you give them maybe a short little 60 second video of you talking about, you know, your music and sending the music and, you know, share your story in a written form and maybe even send them a little gift. You know, it doesn't yeah. hurt. So I think the traditional press kit is not necessary with a lot of these, you know, websites nowadays. So you said there's an often missed opportunity in working with bloggers. Can you expand on that just a little bit more? Like what should you look for if you're an artist that wants to get their material in a blogger's hand to help them reach a whole, you know, new market? Like how would you go about finding the right person to kind of pair up with? Yeah. Or even just approach. Yeah, I would say just Google what your genre is. So for us, like we can all day long Google worship resources or worship blog or worship podcasts, you know, even podcasts are, you know, great opportunities too. So, you know, looking at those on Google, just finding it on Google. And you could even search things like top 10 worship blogs, you know, and you'll see blog posts about the top blogs out there. So there's ways to find the key influencers in that niche and just reaching out to them. Most of them will, you know, get back to you unless you're just self-promoting, you know, and it's all about you. But it's the approach of like, how can I serve you and add value to your audience? Yeah, I do think, you know, we talked about blogging being a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you said to Google people to help find people in your field that might have a blog related to what you're doing. How do you, do you approach bloggers or would you just work on contacting bloggers that have any kind of audience reach or would you recommend searching for someone who has a specific size audience Mm. or is anyone out there writing words and putting it on the internet worth approaching with your music? Yeah, I think if you have the time and energy, reach out to as many people as possible. Like even if they have a hundred readers, that's a hundred people that you probably aren't reaching right now. So I think any blog that is consistently, you know, posting new posts and they have decent amount of social media, you know, following, I think it's worth your time to reach out to them because I have so many friends that I've, you know, just built relationships with over the years who are bloggers that grew, they had a very small blog at the time. And then now it's like, you know, they're huge. So I think you can even help grow their blog, you know, by giving them content and, you know, being part of what they're doing. Yeah. It's even answering questions for me because when I was, Seth and I were both in bands, you know, when we Mm. were younger. And as he said, we are kind of learning this backwards where we jump Mm. in on the back end of it and we're just trying to catch up with everybody, you know, going forwards. So what was it like for you? Because did your blog start first? Or was it the podcast? The podcast started first. The podcast first, yeah. was first. And the so, MySpace page. That's okay. important. <laughs> and, but then you said, but Seth was saying that the blog really helped yeah. escalate things for you. So was there someone that was like, man, you should start a blog based out of your podcast? Or how did that kind of transition into like, okay, this would be a great content ad for me as well. A great way to reach people. Yeah, I think the blog started uh, because I wanted to share like the show notes for the podcast. Yeah. That was the main purpose of it. But then I realized like people really loved reading blogs and blogs were, I feel like blogs were even bigger back then than they are now. I feel like podcasts are huge now (laughs) and blogs aren't as much, at least in 
you know, the circles I'm in, like worship leaders. Well, even podcasts now, I didn't know this until the other day we were talking with a guy from Spotify and Spotify has podcasts yeah. now on yeah. there. And that blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, He was showing us the section. It was like, are you serious now? Yeah. I mean, it, their podcasts are almost playlists where he was mm. talking about guys that have episodes of speaking interjected with songs mm. and other content. And you can literally wow. just experience this, this whole new way yeah. of, of sharing and having a conversation with people. Yeah. So I think, you know, with the blog, I realized, you know, just the need for blogs and there weren't that many blogs out there for worship leaders. And so I just started doing a little bit here and there. And then when I saw the need and, you know, the demand for it, then I started to create more. And, you know, when I was reaching out to like artists to interview them on the podcast, I would get sent different like music and different things. And I would have guest bloggers. And that was my favorite is having guest bloggers yeah. <laughs> because then I don't have to write them. I yeah, just yeah. have to proofread it. Yeah. So <laughs> like, Hey, here's so-and-so's blog. Yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> That's awesome. Do we have any questions rolling in? We're going to grill you with a few questions here. <laughs> All right. So Skylisha says, what is the best platform? And one is the best time to start promoting a new EP. Is there a specific way to get it out to a ton of people? Wow, that's, no <laughs> that's like an hour conversation. <laughs> I don't think there's a best platform. I think there's a lot of platforms that you need to be on. I mean, I think YouTube is a powerful platform. Obviously, you should be on iTunes and Spotify, Apple Music. I mean, kind of depending on your audience. You know, if your audience is older and they buy more like physical CDs, that's a different thing than like if your audience is mainly streaming, then you have to be on all the streaming platforms, including YouTube. And so I think creating video content for YouTube is important. And really there's no like overnight success of like, hey, you can get your music out to thousands of people overnight. It takes work. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. So, and it's great to hear because a lot of people really don't realize it. A lot, even when they move here, yeah. sometimes they think, "Okay, I'm in a city that's musically based. It's going to just happen." But it yeah. does take time. Yeah, and more than ever, there's so much music out there, and every Friday there's <laughs> yeah, new there's music, more. <laughs> and there's you know they're all competing for the ears of you know consumers. So I think it's harder and harder to get your music out to you know a lot of people and to actually get their attention. So I think, especially for independent artists, it's guerrilla marketing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's doing the work and not going like, I need to have this huge budget to put all these ads on all these you know platforms or whatever, but it's actually coming up with creative ways to reach people that, you know, you wouldn't be able to reach through ads. That's awesome. Thank you for the question, by the way. And we got a couple more for you. Sorry, I'm going to butcher some names. So I apologize, <laughs> people. Brady Steinauer asks, does my video content have to be perfectly filmed to catch the attention of record labels? I mean, if you're trying to catch the attention of record labels, it's really not about how perfect the video is, but it's about the song. Yeah. I think the song you know, has to market itself. You know, it has to be a great song because if your video is great, but your song kind of sucks, then yeah. it doesn't matter how much money you spent on the video. Yeah. So I would say like, make sure your song is awesome and it's great and it stands out above all the other songs out there. And if you can film just with your iPhone, if you have no budget and you just have an iPhone, mm -hmm. Have some good lighting, you know. I think lighting is a huge factor that people don't think about. The opposite of what we have going on right now. But you look lovely, I'll say that. <laughs> so if you have great lighting and an iPhone and a mic, I mean, that's a great starting place. So I, I want to piggyback off of that question just for a second. Yeah. So let's say the song is fantastic. Mm -hmm. How important is the quality of the content you're putting out, whether it's a video or like a lyric video or something versus the quantity of the content you're putting out and connecting with people. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to work with what resources you have. So if you're starting out and you don't have a videographer, or like you don't have a budget to hire somebody like mm -hmm. that, 
start with what you have, you know, what, what's in your hands and do it consistently. I think consistency is huge mm -hmm. over quality. Like you could release one amazing video, but if we don't hear from you for 12 months, yep. then you're forgotten. But if you have, you know, an iPhone quality video with amazing songs and you're releasing one every single month, that's much better because people are getting new content from you, you know, on a consistent basis. I love it. Sorry, there's people answering questions too in the chat. So I'm like reading through some of these. All but right. you are getting lots of likes. I'll say that. The <laughs> Facebook live, or sorry, Instagram live community is embracing you. Okay. Carlos Ubinas asks, I'm in a band and we have a new EP out now. It's on iTunes and Spotify, but we aren't getting too much traction on it. What's the best way to get everyone directed to our music? Yeah, you can throw your music up on Spotify and iTunes, and of course you should, but it has to involve marketing. I think creating music and throwing it up on Spotify and iTunes is half the battle. The other battle is, you know, getting the attention of people. Yep. And so you have to utilize social media, you have to utilize, you know, different, you know, aspects of marketing and not just expect people to just listen to your music because it's on Spotify. Because I can record something on my iPhone right now and throw it up on Spotify. Like, yeah. So I think you have to have a strategy around like how you're going to let people know about it. Yeah. And a lot of that, like, you know, what we do at Integrity, like involves social media, you know, and a lot of it doesn't have to cost you anything. You have to just, like we were talking about, like be consistent with, you know, adding value to your audience, uh, whether that's doing a Facebook live thing once a week you know, doing Instagram live and even like a Q and A like this, I think adds value to your audience, you know, and you can do a Q and A on the spot. So, okay. This is going to piggyback off that last question there. This is Jesse Dean Rivero. He's asking, should a band be on every social media platform or concentrate on just a few of them? If you don't have a significant following on any of them, I would say if you're just starting out, yeah, focus on one or two. Figure out what your demographic is. So if your audience is mainly like younger, you might want to try Snapchat or Instagram. You know, if they're more older and more on Facebook, then focus on that. But if you can only focus on one or two platforms, I would do that and do it well. I think that's more you know effective than trying to be on all platforms out there. Let me ask a question following that up. So... As part of integrity, when you're looking at bands or artists, do you look at their social media stats, like followers, their interactions with them? Like how much does that weigh on a decision whether or not to work with an artist or a band? Yeah, I mean, if they have a huge LinkedIn following, we got to sign them. <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> kidding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if they are very good at LinkedIn, <laughs> it's on. They can organize and collate like none before. Yeah, I mean, for us, it does play into it, but we would never sign somebody because they have 3 million followers on Twitter or something, you know, but we do look at that because that shows us what kind of audience they already have and how much work they've put into it themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a small factor of what we look at when we're trying to sign artists. I'll add to that just because it's kind of answering this other question that I'm staring at right yeah. here too. We were at a sync event a while back where they were talking about, you know, film and TV placements and there's a lot of music directors there and they were, being asked similar questions about social media and stuff like that. And a lot of them said, look, if it comes down to a song we're putting in a movie and the director is equally pleased about both songs, mm -hmm. a lot of times he's going to look at, hey, okay, this band has 100,000 followers. This band has 9,000 followers. Yeah. And he's going to say, well, for the same price and a song I don't care either way mm -hmm. about, I can get 100,000 free advertising, yeah. you know, 100,000 people seeing about this for free versus the other band totally. with 9,000. Yeah. So it, it does weigh in every once in a while. Oh, yeah. So Skylisha has a follow-up question for you, by the way. As an independent artist, it is extremely hard to find the right venue to perform at. Not being signed, is there a specific way to get more gigs as an independent artist? I mean, it kind of depends on what kind of music you do, I guess. I would say like if you're a worship artist and you do more church gigs, I mean, you can reach out to churches and, you know, spend the time and energy to send out your music to different churches and areas that you want to target. Mm -hmm. And I think there's 
you have to start, you know, probably with the smaller venues if, you know, churches aren't your thing and reach out to meet maybe even bands that you like and you feel like you connect with on the music level, reach out to them and say, Hey, do you need an opener? You know, can I do a song at your next concert or whatever, you know, but not trying to aim for like, Hey, Taylor Swift. Yeah. <laughs> You know. Taylor Swift, what do you think about my record? <laughs> the kids are loving somebody, it. Yeah. <laughs> Who has a little bit bigger of a platform and more you know, gigs than you do currently. So there's a follow-up question here from Carlos Ubinas as well. He said, thank you very much for your answer to his last question. His band has 29,000 followers on Instagram, but they seem to respond very well to our videos and not as great to our pictures that promote our songs. So would it be just a matter of getting more creative with the marketing of the music mm. to like help them, I guess, get better traction with the pictures that are promoting their songs? Yeah, I would say, I mean, videos definitely do get more engagement on Instagram and Facebook. And I would say you may want to maybe reconsider what kinds of images you're sharing to promote your songs. Because if it's overly promotional, people will just scroll right past it. And I would also say, if you're not using Instagram stories, that's a huge thing that you should take advantage of. And whether that's like playing, you know, parts of your song or get creative and do something fun, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of brings your song into it, but not, it's not like overly promoting the song. You know? So when you said an overly promotive photo, like what would an overly promotive photo be? I would say like posting... Hey, the album cover in like five ninety nine yeah. on iTunes, you know, things like that where it's like basically an ad mm -hmm. and you're promoting the album and that's pretty much all you're doing. But if you're promoting maybe a lyric from a song okay. and with a nice looking image and then the description, you're encouraging the person, you know, yeah. that's reading it. Check it out here. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. That's awesome. So Skylisha is following up once more with, she's reached out to over 500 churches but since she doesn't have a big name, it's very hard. Any advice for her? I would say build relationships. 500 churches is a lot of work. So obviously you're working hard and you're willing to work hard. So, you know, if you aren't getting the response, I think, you know, one thing is building relationships with other worship leaders and that trust because yep. churches are very careful about who they bring in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the bigger names are going to have more credibility and trust because, you know, people know them and they feel like they know them from the music. But if you're somebody that you've never heard of and you don't have any endorsements to back you up, then, yeah, they're going to be more hesitant about it. But if you're getting no response as far as like even your music, maybe even have somebody listen to your music and go, do you think this is, you know, any good? Yeah. And take a step back and just even, you know, consider that, you know, I was going to actually mention the same exact thing. Yeah. She says she's been working with Ben Calhoun from Citizen Way. So maybe I'll have to talk to him about maybe being an opener. And I don't think that's a bad yeah. idea. I mean, that's automatically a name. Citizen Way and Ben are both names that I think a lot of people do trust. Yeah. They've had mild success, you know. And if, <laughs> yeah, if they can't do it, they may know somebody else that could yep. you know, have that opportunity. So. so we've got Brady Steinauer asking, any tips on gaining social media followers? How often should I be posting? I don't want to lose followers because I post too much. Yeah. I would say do not use these phony apps to gain followers. Yeah. I mean, you can literally use these stupid apps to gain 5,000 followers, but you have no engagement because those people don't care about you. <laughs> it's just <laughs> an inflated number. Yeah, they're spam accounts and they, they're not interested in your, in your content. So I would say like build real followers, you know, people who actually are interested in your content and, yeah, I would focus on that rather than like, I have to have thousands of followers. And yeah, the consistency is important. More and more, these platforms are caring more about the quality of your content than, you know, how much you post. Like Twitter, you know, you could have posted 30 times a day and that could have helped you grow your followers. But that's not the right strategy anymore because Twitter's changing into, you know, the same kind of algorithm that Facebook and Instagram use now. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, a timeline feed, but they're showing you the content they think that your followers are going to, you know, like. So, you know, 
I would say if you can stick to like one post a day on Instagram and Facebook and even Twitter, but it's really good content that people will love and engage with, that's more important. And less is more <laughs> in this case. And I would say like use Instagram stories and you know maybe do up to six, but I think past six, if it's not super engaging, you're going to lose people. So, so kind of rolling with that a little bit. So people might have inflated, you know, followers on Instagram and stuff like that. How do artists or upcoming bands that are trying to promote themselves on Instagram know if they're engaging with their audience? Is there a way for them to track like how effective things that they're posting are actually being with the people that they're trying to, you know, capture or engage with? Yeah, I would say look at how many comments you're getting, how many likes you're getting per post. Compare that to another band or artist who has similar number of followers and how much engagement they're getting for their posts and see how you compare with it. And maybe do that with multiple artists you know, out there that have similar number of followers because mm-hmm. that kind of gives you an idea of like, you know, if you're reaching, you know, if you're getting as much engagement as, you know, similar artists. That's money right there. That's absolute gold, people. I think Logan can attest to this. Logan's sitting right next to me. I'm actually holding his phone as we're doing this Instagram thing. But that's something we're learning you know, very rapidly. I know we had an issue with one of our Facebook pages where somehow we just got a super inflated amount of likes or follows on there. Mm. And so a lot of things that we've been testing and just pushing out to people, it's hard to gauge accurately mm-hmm. what's going on because... It's like, well, we have 30,000 people following this page. Why are only, you know, a thousand people engaging with yeah. this specific topic or whatever? Yeah. And I know as being a member of a band for a while, trying to learn all this on your own, it can be extremely confusing yeah. to sit down and try to, you know, articulate what all these numbers mean and to put them into some kind of picture that makes any kind of sense yeah. to people. That's awesome. I think the questions are slowing down for a minute. So I'm going to pass this back over to Logan. And And I'll say one thing about Facebook. You know, Facebook has turned into pay to play. Yeah. So you could have, you know, 50,000 likes on your Facebook page, but you won't be able to organically reach that many people because Facebook wants you to pay for that reach. So I think it's important to not just like boost a post, but really specifically target your audience. So in order to do that, you have to know who your audience is and, you know, utilize that information to target your audience. And there's also a thing called lookalike audiences. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have, you know, tested that out, but you can upload an email list. That's affirmative, by the way. He answered. (laughs) Logan nodded in the affirmative to that one. Yeah. So you can upload your existing email list and create a lookalike audience based on that list. So you're not reaching the people who already are part of your list, but you're reaching new people that are similar to your existing you know, audience. I'm just absorbing everything that you're saying. And what I love most about this is how you learned all this organically, literally yeah. through trial and error, just doing it yourself, figuring out what works and doesn't work. Do you feel like you have a better grasp of it because you learned it that way? Or do you like, do you secretly wish that maybe you'd studied some of this in the past? How has it affected you just learning this on your own and just kind yeah. of, you know, being like a pioneer down this field? Because you literally started when, I mean, we were all on MySpace. Yeah. So, and that just, you know, I didn't know what I was doing yeah. when I was on MySpace. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like I know more of the real-time current marketing strategies that you may not learn in school. And I would say that because I've had university professors tell me like the stuff you know how to do we're not teaching the students at school because you know the information and the strategy is changing so rapidly yeah. they can't put it in textbooks you yeah. know so i subscribe to like 20 podcasts and you know try to absorb as much as possible and stay current with the trends and so i think even if you do go to school for it you have to keep learning it's not one of those things where you can learn once and then you're set for life. You know, you have to every week know like what changed with Facebook, what's yeah. new on Instagram, you know? And a lot of this whole digital realm, the internet is, is all about trial and error. Mm-hmm. And I know one thing that we do preach at our events and, you know, often on this podcast with, you know, not just ourselves, but other people on it is learning by doing is such a powerful way to yeah. actually embrace, you know, the whole learning experience to actually do it and figure it out for yourself. It just sticks it in your head that much harder. So how did developing all this marketing knowledge 
lead into your transition into a job with integrity and to kind of where you are now? Yeah. What's funny is I've always dreamed about working at a record label yeah. even as a kid because I just loved Christian music and Christian radio. Grew up with it, you know. And it was such a huge part of my life. And that was my dream to work at a record label or start a record label or something. Yeah. And when I was doing, you know, all about worship and working at a church and doing some consulting, one of my clients was Centricity. They were launching Centric Worship. So I was heading up marketing for that. They had hired an agency and wasn't happy with the results. So I dug into their social media and, you know, helping launch their projects. So almost three years ago, my wife and I prayed and really felt like we're supposed to move to Nashville. We didn't know what we were going to be doing. I was going to lose the church job, you know. So we had to figure out like, what are we going to do to make ends meet? So it was a huge step of faith, but we just felt called to be here, you know. And so when I let Centricity know, they asked me to come on board full time. So I was full time with them. And then I transitioned to Integrity Music two and a half years ago. And what's funny is I had actually applied two different times at Integrity Music, like sent my resume through their website. Never heard anything back. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, now like it's been just an amazing journey with them. And I love the team that we have and what I get to do. So yeah, it was totally a God thing, you know, just through relationships and God opening doors. That's awesome. So on a day-to-day -day basis, what is it you do? What do you look forward to the most in your day now? Now that you're working your dream job at a record label, yeah. what, what's the day like for you now? My favorite part is just hours and hours of meetings in the conference room. No, yeah. I'm just <laughs> totally kidding. <laughs> Some days are just hours and hours of meetings in the conference room, which can really be hard, you know? Yeah. So, but we have a really fun environment where... You know, Morgan's here. She will just break out into a dance party in the middle of the day. <laughs> so we keep it very just fun and you know lively in the office. And we're really like a big family. Everybody gets along and just loves working with each other. So day to day things you know are different. Like one day I might be at a video shoot. One day I might be at a photo shoot. One day I might be just at my computer creating a marketing plan for an artist, yeah. you know, or just replying to emails, you know, like next week, you know, I'll be at a conference, a worship leader conference. So I love the fact that there is so much variety with the job and the interaction I get to have with the team and the artists and worship leaders and just being able to dream up ideas and execute them because we aren't, you know, stuck to a, a formula. You know, we're always trying to come up with like, what can we do for this artist that's different from what we've done before, you know, yeah. and what's going to work for this artist? Maybe that's not going to work for this other artist, yeah. you know. With the ever evolving internet, how easy is it to fall into habits of like what's worked with past artists? And is it difficult to kind of formulate a new strategy with upcoming artists if especially with trends in like we were talking about with Instagram and how certain posts definitely mm -hmm. work better than other posts. Yeah. Is it difficult to keep evolving how you're, how you're approaching things and different images you're using or different video content that you're using as opposed to just being like, well, this has been working. Should we kind of just yeah. stick with that? It is difficult. And it is a challenge and it is way more time consuming than having a strategy and it always working, you know, because Last October, we released a bunch of, you know, projects. And then, you know, the coming months, we're going to be releasing more projects. March, we had a ton of thousand releases, yeah. you know. And the strategy has been changing. Like, even since October or March, you know, our strategies, we've had to tweak because, you know, Instagram stories is big now. So we try to utilize that and put it into the strategy. You know, some artists will do cover videos with them of big worship songs. Mm -hmm. Some artists, it doesn't make sense as much, you know. So it does take a lot more work. And I think the iron sharpens iron comes in because our team isn't afraid to challenge each other and go like, hey, have you thought about this? You know, like, what about doing this this way? So I think that's important to have that trust and respect for each other to be able to, you know, 
challenge each other on an ongoing basis. And on a day-to-day basis, do you find yourself looking at other social media accounts that aren't directly tied to what you're doing? Like, how important is it, like, comparatively shopping, so to speak? Yeah. Looking at what other people are doing, what's working, what's not working? Oh, yeah. I'm always watching what other people are doing. I'm kind of a stalker. No, No, I am definitely watching, like, what other artists are doing, what other labels are doing, what you know, different movements are doing and different marketers are doing and even looking at ads that people do on Instagram or Facebook and going, oh, that's interesting and taking screenshots of it and then maybe sending it to Morgan at, you know, 11 p.m. at night because I work really late. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, I'm always trying to absorb like, okay, I see this. I think that's a great idea. I see this. I think that doesn't work, you know. So, and even just keeping up with the changes, like just last night, I updated my Snapchat and now you can literally stalk people on Snapchat (laughs) on the map and see like where they are (laughs) in that very moment. That's a little creepy. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, no thanks. I'm not turning that up. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Some of it might be going a little far, (laughs) but one thing we've kind of noticed in music, you know, lately it's the genre lines are getting smaller and smaller they're, mm. they're like going away yeah. pretty much it's not just in christian music because christian music is one of those genres that actually has like a bunch of sub genres because mm-hmm. there can be you know christian based rap or country yeah. you know all faith-based stuff and now that's kind of all filtering away especially with the internet it's turning a lot more into the song is the winner if it's mm-hmm. a great song it connects with people because people can now listen to whatever they want yeah. with search engines like apple music yeah. or with spotify literally they can have access to anything at any time and it's not relegated to okay, I'm in Best Buy and I'm looking at the Christian section, I'll find that there, or the hard mm-hmm. rock section, I'll find that there. Yeah. So with people getting on social media, you had mentioned earlier, you know, finding people inside your genre that you're similar to, is it important at all to see what extremely successful people are doing, maybe even beyond the basis of where you are, like comparative to oh, like yeah. where you're parallel to? Or how far out should they be looking to kind of set an example or, or to just see what's working for people? Yeah, and I think... That's, I mean, so important, especially with having a current sound. You know, I think a lot of Christian music doesn't sound current, at least to me. That's my opinion. (laughs) And to me, I think it's important to even listen to the mainstream secular music Mm -hmm. and be familiar with that sound, like what's hot right now, you know, and being able to learn from that, you know, even if it's not your sound like maybe if you're a worship band that's not your sound like as a pop yeah. sound but you can learn from that you know yeah. you can learn the different sounds that they're using in that song that may add more you know dynamics to your song and make it more interesting or better you know yeah so i think to me like i'm always trying to learn and like hear you know all genres like i listen i follow a bunch of different playlists on spotify and yeah check those out. So I would say like, that's a great way to stay current with what's happening is playlists, you know, follow the big playlists on Spotify and in different genres and the discover weekly playlists and things like that. So that's awesome. How are we looking on Instagram live over there? We are still live on Instagram live. (laughs) It's gotta be one of the longest Instagram (laughs) live videos of, of like all time. Logan's handing me this. So it makes me feel like we have something to answer for. Is somebody saying you're wrong? No. (laughs) <laughs> no one's saying you're wrong. We have a pr- the man's name is Wisdom. <laughs> but he can do no wrong, say no wrong. I mean, come on. So, okay, here we go. We got a couple more questions here. Brady Stein Sauergen. Sorry if I'm butchering your name, by the way, buddy. <laughs> what is the best way to get your music into the hands of record label to hear? Direct mail, email, etc. Whew, man. I would say the best way is to go to these events that we were talking about before, you know, like Immerse or Full Circle Academy. You know, there's so many events and conferences out there where you can actually go meet somebody, you know, from a label or meet an artist that is signed with a label. And I don't think it's a bad idea to hand them a CD, but I would say like go beyond just saying, here's my CD, but like, put your story into that Mm -hmm. and let people be able to relate to your story. So like maybe create a little package that you can give somebody. Cause I go to so many conferences where all they give me is a CD. 
Yeah. Like I have a thousand of these and I don't really have a CD player anymore. Yeah. So like, I don't know what to do with this, you know? So like give it to them in a CD format, but also in a digital format with something that really makes you stand out from everybody else. And there's also, I think different labels have different processes of like how they, you know, take submissions. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't take submissions through their website. For Integrity Music, I would say a great way to submit your songs is through our worship resource site called weareworship.com. There's a section at the bottom that says song share, and you can upload, I think, up to three of your original songs. And we listen to those songs. And if something is a gem, you know, there might be an opportunity there. So we intentionally created that so that we can hear, you know, from somebody who's living in Alaska or something yeah. <laughs> that wrote a great song, you know, we don't want to miss those opportunities to hear those songs. So meet them at events guys. Come on. Yes. <laughs> Let's do this thing. All right. We got one more here. Mariah salt light wants to know what podcasts would you recommend for the business side of the music industry? Obviously outside of the full circle music <laughs> show. Um, what podcast? Yeah. All right. Let me see if I can pull up some. Of this. We're going firsthand knowledge here. He's Man. pulled his phone out. <laughs> We're, we're digging deep. I love it. <laughs> so I listen to a podcast through this app called Overcast. I love this app, but this isn't a music industry podcast, but I think this is a really great podcast for artists to subscribe to because it helps you tell your story. It's called Building a Story Brand with Donald Miller. That's a great one. Of course, Full Circle Music Show is a great one. I've heard it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've heard the Wisdom Moon episode's going to be legendary. <laughs> I'm anxious to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. There's, man, I actually don't subscribe to a lot of like music podcasts outside of yours. <laughs> so, well, thank you. We, we, are glad, we are glad to have you. <laughs> I listen to a lot of like business or social media podcasts because I'm trying to keep up with that. You know, so like there's... I'm Social Media Examiner Show. I was going to ask you too, how much different are just straight up business podcasts versus music business podcasts? Because at, at a yeah. certain point, advertising and branding or business principles in general are kind of universal, right? Yeah, I would say, I mean, besides like listening to the Full Circle one, like every artist needs to look at themselves as an entrepreneur yeah. and a business owner. So I think it's important to listen to podcasts like Startup Podcasts, where you're hearing stories of like how somebody started a business. And those I find like are super inspiring and gives you so many great ideas. You know, Mike Rowe has one called mm -hmm. The Way I Heard It, which is awesome. There's social media marketing podcast, which is good. This app called Buffer that we use, has a podcast called The Science of Social Media. That one's great too. Open for Business is great. I have a lot of podcasts on here. How I, I Built it. This is great. Yeah, How um, I Built This is one of my favorites. Yeah, so I would say like, man, you have to put on the entrepreneur hat and try to learn from other entrepreneurs that were successful in whatever industry they're in. Knowledge bombs are being <laughs> dropped left and right. Wisdom, we've had a great time with you, man. Anything, Me too. anything you want to pass on to our listeners in closing? Anything you wish you would have known before you started this whole journey that would have made your life a lot easier? You know, I would say one thing that I always try to emphasize whenever I talk at conferences or whatever is relationships and building relationships that are genuine and not like, what can you do for me relationships? I think so many people approach the music industry that way, where maybe they move to Nashville or they meet somebody from the music industry and it's like, what can you do for me? You know, instead of, hey, I'm interested in you and who you are and how can we, you know, help each other kind of thing. So I think wherever you meet, people from the music industry, like think of it as, you know, like this is an opportunity to build a genuine long lasting relationship with this person. Wisdom, thank you so much, man. Thank it's you. been the Full Circle Music it. Show with Wisdom Moon. Hey everyone, this is X O'Connor and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This episode was produced by the Full Circle Music Company with editing help from Jericho Scroggins and Jordan Salamone. 
Again, huge episode coming up at the end of the month, our 100th episode. And to go along with it, we've got a really huge announcement that we're going to be making for you guys. So stick around. And if you're in iTunes, leave us a rating, leave us a review. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe, leave us a comment. We love hearing from all of our listeners. And to keep up with all things Full Circle Music, follow us on Instagram at Official FC Music. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode and we're looking forward to seeing you all next week.